Hello, Original Posting. Uh, this is going to be the last episode because I'm going to cover the last four chapters in this, I don't know, would you call it an episode? Whatever it is. I'm going to go ahead and read chapters 7 through 10 in one sitting. Uh, so this one might be longer than the others, but I think it'll be worth it because we'll finally get to finish Christopher Anthony Berry's literary masterpiece, really. Um, so I have to say I'm extremely excited. Chapter 7 of Planet Earth, Seized of Destruction. Throughout the world, devastations were taking place, hitting its peak. Earthquakes were happening every hour, cracking the ground miles long and miles wide, leaving nothing but big dark cracks throughout the world and its cities, like no one had ever seen before. Gas lines were broken, creating explosions blowing up housing tracks. Water was shooting upward from the broken city water lines. Sinkholes took place all throughout the world, taking down parts of cities that were as big as football fields. A hundred-foot tower was easily sucked under by a sinkhole that was deeper than anything that was deeper than anyone has ever seen before. Such a dark black abyss to nothing. In Arizona, cities were reaching world record temperatures of 130 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit causing trash cans and other plastic objects like fences and mailboxes to melt. Falling over, puddling on the ground, it looked as if someone set fire to it. Cars began to melt where the plastic pieces such as the brake lights were, along with the inside dashboards. Glass windows started shattering out, causing a loud pop noise due to the pressure and high temperatures the heat was causing. Animals and people started to dehydrate and die because the heat was too much to handle. With very bad humidity, what? Okay. With very bad humidity creating the oxygen to produce at a much lower level as if it was killing it off. What? Uh okay, anyway, the sky was filled with airplanes due to the pilots panicking from not having any communication with people on land. Seeing the devastation occurring below them, unable to see the path or have anyone instruct them on where to land. Some runways were even damaged because of the earthquakes and sinkholes that occurred. The passengers were all in panic as well due to the horrible scene they were witnessing below them. A few elderly passengers had heart attacks, and some young passengers began to pass out. Just as everyone was watching in terror the devastation below them, heavy winds started to pick up, creating massive turbulence for some planes. Many planes ended up crashing into one another, and some were hurtling downwards towards Earth. Only a few planes were able to land safely in random areas throughout the trees and open grass fields. Some airplanes shredded to pieces from attempting to land. Only one plane landed in the water, and because they had the proper emergency equipment, they were able to make it safely onto a raft. Volcanoes were erupting, filling the air with more heat and pollution, with thick black clouds forming and creating an ashy rain that came down on everything around it. Lava was also taking out nearby homes and cities, creating more of a natural humanity disaster, making people rush from their homes to try and find safety. Tornadoes were also forming, causing massive rainstorms with baseball-sized hail. Fire twisters began shooting upward towards the sky. Solar heat waves started burning throughout the world, hitting sections of small cities, turning everything it touched to ash creating massive forest fires burning all the way to housing tracks, destroying everything in its path. Firemen were unable to control or maintain any of the fires happening. They were too focused on getting the people to safety. Ocean waters started to warm at high temperature, creating low pressure water vapors that started to fuel hurricanes, creating many more throughout the ocean. Massive hurricanes started occurring off of every coastline, hitting land 
making massive tsunamis in Texas, New York, Florida, Japan, Africa, and China all across the world. Winds up to 200 to 300 miles per hour. Nothing any human has ever seen before, tearing down buildings just by the rain and winds, sucking the shorelines and beaches dry for miles. Hurricanes were vacuuming water backwards from the oceans, and as the hurricane would pass by, it would cause the water to then rush back to shore, causing many tsunamis to wash up all over our cities and shorelines. And that's the end of chapter 7. That was just a great chapter. I mean, literally, I don't know how many times he has to tell us the exact same thing over and over again, but anyway. Chapter 8. As Sarah, Luther, Tony, and Eric all began their separate journeys to find Chris, they ended up crossing paths along the way. Oh, how convenient. When Tony and the kids went to stay at a motel in Nevada on the way to their destination, they decided it was best to get some rest from being very exhausted. <laughs> not, uh, not sleeping for full a day. Not sleeping for full a day. As they were just about to hit the sheets of the motel bed and get some rest, a few burglars slashed the tires of their car. They were driving and kicked the door in and tried to rob Tony and the kids. <laughs> right as that was going on with Tony and the kids, Eric happened to pull up to the same motel. I don't remember who any of these characters are, honestly. They're so inconsequential. They have no life stories, nothing. We just, whatever. Um... Since they were both heading towards the same direction, Eric noticed the burglars trying to rob a father and his two kids as it was as clear as day out in the open. Eric reached in the back of his truck to grab his AR-15 to go save the people in need. He walked up behind the men as he loaded his rifle. The men looked back. One man had a baseball bat and the other had a knife. Eric said to the men, leave now and no one gets hurt. The, the men in the back, you know, someone said in, uh, in one of the Facebook groups that the way he writes is how someone who doesn't read, a, you know, doesn't read writes, but someone who watches a lot of action movies. And I totally see that. He writes like, you know, like the script for a bad Michael Bay action movie. That's basically what this is, um, except worse. You know, I would honestly pay a lot of money to see this made into a movie. I really would. So uh, if someone wants to take it to that next level and go ahead and make a homemade movie based on Planet Earth Seas of Destruction, I will pay you. I mean, I can't finance it, but. Uh, the man in the back with the knife with nothing but hate in his face reached for his pistol on his back left hip. As he drew his pistol Towards Eric, Eric fired three rounds into his chest, knocking him to the ground. <laughs> the man with the bat instantly dropped it and took off running. Eric grabbed Tony's hand to help him up off the ground after the burglars knocked him down. Tony said, thank you, man. Now let's get out of here. As Tony, Eric, Sarah, and Luther left towards the door, Tony noticed that the car tires were slashed. Tony looked around and yelled, dang it, we have no car. They sliced our tires. Eric overheard and shouted, you and your kids can ride with me. That's my truck over there, as he pointed to his big white truck. Tony and the kids told Eric, thank you, you are so kind. Once they got acquainted, once they got acquainted, acquainted with one another, they began to understand that they both had the same journey. That they well, they began to understand that they both had the same journey they were going on. As they were driving in the truck, they witnessed all around them the sad and devastating world around them. That sounds great. They witnessed all around them the sad and devastating world all around them. Along the way, they found some outsiders camping and decided to stop and talk to see what they knew and get some rest once again. Yeah, that sounds like a bad idea. They almost just got robbed and they just saw some people camping on the side of the road and they were like, hey, you know what, let's, let's go to sleep here in front of these strangers that we do not know that are camping on the side of the road. I mean, 
really the decisions that the people make in this book are, you know, it makes a lot of sense because these are the shitty life decisions that Chris B makes. You know, um, since there wasn't any electricity, TV broadcasts or radio, they were all out of luck on how to track down Chris. The outsiders overheard the conversation between the four and later that night told them there's a special radio broadcast that we know of and the guy's name is Chris and he was signaling for the world and people to participate and help bring it back and heal it again. Okay, let me see if that's the right page. Yes. Uh, the moment they all heard them say that, they rushed inside of Eric's truck to flip on the special radio station that the outsiders told them about. Tony and Eric were awaiting Chris's broadcast when Eric offered Tony to sleep in the bed of his truck with his kids so they can rest since they were all exhausted, since it had a camper shell, uh, since it had a camper shell to protect them. Luckily, Eric came prepared and had a bed and blankets in the back. A whole bed? Oh, the guy with the truck? Yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, for easy sleep while traveling, he knew Tony and his kids would get good sleep. As Eric waited up throughout the night, he finally received Chris's broadcast call at, that came in at 5 a.m. He immediately woke up Tony to tell him he found the exact location in California where Chris was at. Once the kids woke up by overhearing the conversation, they rapidly got ready to begin their journey again towards Chris. So we're going to that um, nice little trailer that we saw that Chris stays at. Is that where the exact location is? Do you guys remember um, how he claimed to have bought a house? And uh, it turns out that he lives in a trailer. But, you know, not only that, um, it was not his. He didn't own it. And I'm pretty sure it was his mom's, right? Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't someone who knows him IRL, like, go to get into a fight with him or something and filmed it, kind of, and he was just acting like a little bitch? I mean, I'm not shaming people that live in trailers. The last place that I lived in was a trailer, actually, and it was expensive as shit. It was literally as expensive as an apartment. But uh, if you can't find some place to live, what are you going to do? I mean, and I'm not shaming, whatever. I don't know why I'm going off on this tangent, but I'm also not shaming people that uh, buy trailers or choose to live in them. Like, obviously, there's nothing wrong with that, but... The fact that Chris B claimed to have bought a house when he actually lives in a trailer and he didn't buy the trailer either. You know what? That reminds me of this girl I know that just told the most insane lies and you guys would love her. Um, I don't know if I want to share anything about her, but you guys would honestly love her. If you're obsessed with Chris B and you're obsessed with um, Uncle Adams, you'd be obsessed with Chelsea Nicole. That's spelled C-H-E-A-L-S-A-Y. N-I-C-O-L-E, Chelsea Nicole. She uh, she lives in the town I live in, down in Redneck, Texas. And I remember, you know, the lies are just too much to even tell, especially since I'm literally in the middle of reading a story to you and my ADHD just kicks in. But um, she, I remember her telling me that she bought an RV um, and then magically somehow something happened once her lease was up you know, her lease that she had to leave the, she was like, oh, I just left it there. Like I just, you know, I decided I didn't want it. So I decided to go rent somewhere else. You know, I just didn't really feel like, um, trying to bother, like bringing it with me and everything. And I was like, girl, you were renting it. Don't fucking lie. Like just the stupidest lies or like the time that she showed me a picture of Lady Gaga's high heels. And I was like, yeah, I actually used to own those, but I sold them. And I'm just like, why? Why are you telling these lies for no fucking reason? That's Chris B. I mean, it's just, oh, these people need help, honestly. She also told me that she was a psychiatrist, that she worked as a psychiatrist. And I was like, well, <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry. I should probably just cut that part out. I'm, I promise. I'm gonna read the story I promise um let me see if I can find my place sorry um once the kids woke up by overhearing the conversation they rapidly got ready to begin their journey again towards Chris as they were embarking on their journey Eric mentioned to Tony 
Chris is in San Francisco on the highest mountaintop and elevation in an underground bunker with the largest antenna pole there is in San Francisco. Chris said he wrote a sign saying safe haven. Bruh. Chris B has the mind of a child. He does. Tony then pulled out a map. Sarah and Luther are very smart in school, so he handed it to them. <laughs> ah, ah. He couldn't read a map, had to give it to the kids. Um, hey, I can't read a map either. Uh, from there, they were able to find the exact location Chris was mentioning on the broadcast. Yeah, because they just saw the label Safe Haven on the map. Um, the highest mountaintop and elevation around. Once they had their head heading, they were on their way. No one could stop them now. Chapter 9, and this one also has a title. A couple days before the destruction occurred, dot, dot, dot. Ooh, now we're having a flashback. This is really fancy storytelling. A scientist came across Chris and his theory the day he was mentioned on the news. He told Chris he wanted him to come to his lab in Oregon so they can study more about his theory and how to pump oil back into the earth. Is it Oregon or Oregon? Oregon. I think it's Oregon. Chris flew out and arrived at the lab just a few hours later that day with his wife and son. As the scientists had a safe place to keep them safe for the time being, Chris and the scientists headed to the lab and started their project and plan on how to pump oil back into the earth. Only a full day of hard work. They were both able to come up with a solution. Once they found the solution to the problem, a massive earthquake occurred at that exact moment, striking after one another, not like the normal earthquakes that have been occurring. Bringing down the very lab they were standing and working in, Chris quickly grabbed the hard drive that the project was saved to and rushed out of the building. Meanwhile, all the other scientists got stuck and didn't make it out alive, <laughs> leaving Chris the only survivor with the answers needed to save the world in his very hands. <gasps> um, moments before the earthquake occurred, the scientists were telling Chris about a bunker they all need to get to in the highest mountaintop with the highest elevation point in San Francisco with the largest antenna communications pole. It has a frequency so strong enough it will reach private radio stations throughout the entire world, sending broadcasts to the people in hope to fix the solution to the planet. On Chris's journey to San Francisco, he was unable to take the normal path of the road due to all the sinkholes and forest fires blocking his path. He worked his way across the coastline, hoping to travel by boat. He came across nothing but thousands of dead fish, whales, sharks, and dolphins washed up on the shorelines. Chris noticed that the waters were no longer blue, but instead a midnight black. He walked up to the water, curious of what the black was in the ocean. As he put his hand in, he realized it was an oil spill. Isn't that good? You'd think that'd be good for the planet, right? Do you guys hear that rain outside? It's like creating such a nice ambient atmosphere to read this book to. I, I love it. I'm loving it. Uh, noticing the offshore oil fields were broken and spewing oil all over the ocean. There was no one around. No paramedics. No Coast Guard. Nothing but regular people trying to save their own lives. Chris tried looking for a boat, but suddenly realized they were all damaged due to the hard waves of the tsunamis that occurred earlier that day. As Chris had a long, hard journey, he finally made it to the bunker in San Francisco, giving off the broadcast for three days straight, letting everyone and anyone know where he is and where they need to get to safety. Help protect our planet and save it from mass destruction. After several days of waiting, Chris finally saw a big white truck coming up the hill. Driving through some obstacles, the truck managed to make it halfway up the mountain. Chris ran out, noticing two men getting out of the truck, along with two young kids. What? Okay, why was this chapter uh, titled Before the Destruction? Because obviously, obviously, uh, these scientists found Chris talking about his theory. So that was after the destruction had already started occurring. So none of this was before the destruction started. None of this was a flashback to before the first chapter. It was 
it was like a flashback to a little bit before these people found his radio station because it was before he went to the bunker. But it was after the beginning of the book. I mean, I don't know. I could probably point out discrepancies all day, but what would be the point when the entire book is a mistake? The entire book is just a mistake. It's it's a mistake. Making this was a mistake, Crispy. It really was. But you know what? I guess it kind of wasn't because quite a few people bought it. I know I bought it. It was like $12, $14, something like that. And um, qu I know quite a few people actually bought it, so he probably got a good chunk of change from this. Maybe like $100, $200, something like that. I don't know. I'm just guessing that might be too much because uh, I don't really know how many people bought it. But I feel like it was probably at least like several times the people that we saw posting, you know, pictures and stuff. So maybe it was a good idea. I mean, not for the world in general, but just for his pocketbook. Um, driving through some obstacles, the truck managed to make it halfway up the mountain. Chris ran out, noticing two men getting out of the truck, along with two young kids. Chris began to shout at the four people, I am up here! Keep going straight! Make a left at the tree! There is a side door to the bunker I'll open for you. As the four made it up to the hill, as the four made it up the hill to the door, Chris opened it. They walked in, and Tony, Tony immediately said, "Thank you, Chris. If it wasn't for you, we would all be goners. We had nowhere to go. This is Sarah, my daughter, Luther, my son, and this guy is Eric. He actually saved our life the other day." They began chit-chatting and getting to know one another. Chris said, "You're welcome, but I haven't saved the world yet." Oh, he's so modest. I need some help to get started. I have the formula and solution to the earth. I have the formula and solution to get the earth back to normal. The only issue and problem I have that is stopping me is I can't seem to function the computers here properly. Sorry about that. Um, I can't seem to function the computers here properly. They are not your average computer. Also, there is some sort of code on the hard drive that I can't break as well. And the broadcast radio station is only picking up certain cities and states in the USA. I need to go worldwide and hit every radio station there is. Luther and Sarah quickly replied, We can fix it for you, and actually learning we're actually learning about that in computer class right now. I love how, like, the kids in class are the geniuses. Like, they're just in, you know, normal high school classes, um, I'm assuming, but they're smarter than all the adults. And I, I feel like this is, like, Chris unconsciously, you know, revealing. You know what they say, like, revealing the truth about his life. Because you know what they say um, is right about what you know. You know, so kids are smarter than him. He does have a child, does he not? I'm pretty sure he does, right? I don't know. You know, I haven't kept up with Chris B a lot lately because I've been getting banned from Facebook every single goddamn month. Like, every other month. I might have, like, a week or two on Facebook. I keep getting banned for saying the word bitch. Like, are you actually kidding me? We can't say the word bitch. I didn't even call anyone a bitch. I, I just say, like, bitch, are you serious? Like, it's so dumb. I honestly can't. Um, Luther turned to his dad and said, Don't get mad, Dad. As he turned back to Chris and continued to say, I am a, prof <laughs> I am a pro professional hacker and software genius. I can work those computers for you and crack that hard drive in only a few minutes for you. I have no words. You know what, Chris? You, yeah, you're a great writer. Sarah then responded, I can get the radio fix for you so you can broadcast all the stations worldwide, interfering through anything blocking the broadcast. Oh, God. Well, I guess the storm is going to ruin this, but, you know, I'm just going to keep reading through it. Like I said, it creates a great ambience for, uh, for the reading, the dramatic reading. Sarah and Luther were quickly able to get everything up and running within 30 minutes. Chris thanked the kids for their hard work. Chris quickly jumped over to the microphone and started the bro to broadcast, explaining to the world his theory once more with what him and the fellow scientists came up with. Chris was finally starting to get incoming messages back from the public, all because Sarah fixed the radio and microphone. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks a lot. 
All right, guys, this is chapter 10. This is the very last chapter um, of Planet Earth Seas Through Destruction by Christopher Anthony Berry. Um, I have to say I'm very sad that it's already over, and I really do hope that Chris B. will write another novel soon because I don't know how you know much longer I can survive without another work of his. And I really hope that he will be recognized for his hard work and genius someday soon because he does deserve it. Chapter 10. Chris started to explain through his broadcast to the world his theory. Pumping oil back into the ground slash earth to lubricate the planet and fault lines is what we need to do to heal and replenish the earth to bring itself back so it can heal properly from the state of destruction. Think about it, people. Oil has pressure as if it was meant to be in the ground and not drilled into and pumped out. It meant to just stay there. There is not a volcano where it needs to erupt naturally. It is not a volcano where it needs to erupt naturally. It's almost as if oil was there for a reason and meant to stay underground and lubricate our earth. If you think about it over the years, all the oil we kept pulling, as we pulled more, we noticed more earthquakes, weird, unusual weather, and sinkholes started occurring. Our planet was fine and healthy until the first day mankind pulled oil from this beautiful planet, destroying it. What would we want to destroy something we live off of and live on? Without this Earth, we wouldn't even exist. We can't go live on another planet, and we can't go live on the moon. We have to live here, so we need to take care of our planet. If we continue to pull this oil, it is going to make the planet Earth seize up and explode as if an engine in a car with no, as if an engine in a car with no oil would do. Okay, but this really this shows where he got Planet Earth seized of destruction because he's thinking of an engine seizing up. So, you know, that's um, I see his thought process. I mean, it's broken, but I see it. The Earth is overheating and not being lubricated or cooled down like it needs to be. And that's why the planet is getting worse, because we are sucking Mother Nature dry of its resources for our selfish needs. Chris also began to explain to the experts and oil rig workers who were listening in and reaching out. You need to start extracting the water back out from the ground that you filled up after taking the oil out. Once the water is completely empty, you will need to refill it back up with the oil that we have saved in the warehouses and have started extracted, sitting in bins, and pump that back into the earth and plug the hole and shut the valve off. Bitch, what? Literally, bitch, what? So, first of all, is that a thing? Do people take oil out of the ground and put water in its place? I've never heard of that in my life. Um, but, you know, I don't know anything about oil, obviously. So I don't know if that's true or not. But I would be willing to bet that was a lie. Somebody, please tell me if that's a lie or not. Um, I just, what? <laughs> Anyway, the men then agreed and said, we will all get right to it, Chris. Thank you for informing us on this. God. Chris was able to reach out to even more workers and the public to help participate and gather as much oil from every vehicle or piece of equipment with oil they can find. Chris told them to go to your nearest collection center where there will be huge trucks and people gathering to help make this possible. Everyone agreed and began to collect oil, participate, and work together to heal this planet. Chris thanked Tony, Luther, Sarah, and Eric for their help because he would not have been able to do it without them. Chris then met up with his wife and son and lived their days happily ever after. Everyone knew they had a short time in healing this planet to get it done, so everyone jumped quickly to it and slowly. As the men and women started to pump the oil back into the earth, within hours, they noticed the earthquake slowly started to stop and weaken. Sinkholes stopped appearing, and the weather started to go back to normal. The people were very shocked with how fast the results were taking place. After a year, the planet was finally able to replenish itself and go back to normal, with no more earthquakes or unusually hot and cold weather. The people realized how quickly life can be over if you do not take care of what gives you life. Since that devastating day, the presidents all around the world came to a truce and declared no more oil pulling from the earth and to only run off of solar for the rest of human life. The end. That was the end. Uh, now, that was page 
71. And as you may or may not know, this book is over 100 pages long. And you want to know what the rest of it is? Just really shitty pictures that he took off of Google of literally nothing. Like, here's a pic... Oh, I think he might have taken some of these. There's a lot of pictures. Do you guys... I don't know if you guys saw that. Someone reposted it in crispy accent posting. The uh, the picture... Or, I mean, the video where he... Um, there was, like, that road collapse, the bridge collapse. And, and he took a video of it and was like, wow, that's crazy. They're trying to cover it up. I think most of these are just pictures, like, stills from that video. And then here's some pictures of, like, power lines, uh, fires... You know, stuff he got off. Yeah, and then it says, Photos taken by Christopher Anthony Berry. And then we have just nothing. Like, you know, he you buy a book that's 100, you know, over 100 pages long, and you get 70 pages of words on huge, huge fucking font. He could have fit this entire book into a much smaller book, around 30 pages. Also, uh... Not to mention that that entire concept of the story could have been pared down to just a couple paragraphs. I mean, it was like he just kept saying the same thing over and over and over and over. Like it, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, it's a nice novelty. Um, he's so bad. He's so bad at writing. He's so bad at writing. Um, and I honestly, maybe, you know, because he made some money off of this, he'll go ahead and make another book. I don't know. I really hope he will, and I hope it's even more ridiculous than this one. This one was pretty, pretty fucking ridiculous. His theory, everything. And I'm almost certain, I would be willing to bet on it, that he really thinks that that's a way to help the planet. He really thinks that the planet needs oil inside it to run, you know, like an engine. I believe that he believes that. I do. I hope I hope he he talks about it and he's like, you know, you know what he probably wanted? He probably wanted, sorry, he probably wanted he this is what he thinks is going to happen. He publishes this book and people take notice and like some scientists are like Chris B is a genius. He wrote this book, but his theory was true. And they're going to start doing that, and it's going to save the planet. And he's going to be hailed as a savior, you know. He wants to be a hero and a savior and a martyr, you know. He just, oh, God, he loves himself so, so, so much. He really does. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and upload this once again. If you listen till the end, um, I think I had someone comment. I'm going to go look at my other video. I had someone comment um, responding to me about the true crime podcast. Um, so I'm not sure how to get in contact with them. So if you're the same person, um, you should totally, you know what, actually, I'm going to go back to that comment. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to create a true crime podcast. I just need someone to do the podcast with, um, where I go ahead and tell you a story and you respond to the story, you know, react, give your opinion. Um, so if anyone thinks that's interesting, uh, I guess subscribe to my YouTube channel because I'm probably going to upload the podcasts onto my YouTube channel. I'm also going to put them on Spotify and everywhere else. I mean, you can do it for free. Um, you know, I just would like to be able to put that out there. It's something fun to do. Not saying it'll be successful, but I really enjoy podcasts. And if you do too, you should subscribe to this. You know, if you would be interested in listening to a true crime podcast that I might make in the future. All right. So that was fun. I had fun reading the book. I hope you had fun listening to it, even though I did ramble a lot. Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for listening, guys. Hope you have a great day. You know, bye, guys. <laughs>